Um, if you have got a Bible, please keep it open at Matthew chapter 26. And whilst you're uh, perhaps returning to Matthew chapter 26, um, I want to ask you a big question this morning and um, see why, if you want, there is a sheet over there that you, if you want to take notes or um, do a sketch or fill in the blanks, um, then there aren't those uh, notes there for you. And on the top of that sheet, there is a question that I want to ask everybody. And here's the question. What am I worth? What am I worth? Um, or to put it another way, if I had to put you in my little shop this morning and put a label on you, how much would I put on the label? So I looked up on Google, how much is a human worth? I was quite shocked because I think when I was a youth, I'd go to talks and they would say, apparently you're worth £1.20. That is not so. You're actually worth a lot more than that because of um, the need to replace body parts. Um, so actually, if you look at all of your body parts, you are worth, and it's interesting that you can only find this in American websites, not British, but interestingly, $45 million. But because it would be so unethical to sell your parts, I'd have to do it illegally on the black market, and therefore you're only worth $550,000. But it's still quite impressive, isn't it, by what you're worth. But unfortunately, um, if I did cut you up for body parts, you would be dead. Um, so I don't know what you're worth. What is the label? But I guess this morning, some of us in the congregation have maybe already had a label of worth put on us or have put the label of worth on us ourselves. So today is Mother's Day. Uh, for many of us, it's a great day. For, for others of us, it's a very difficult day. Perhaps some this morning have put a label on themselves and said, well, this is how many chocolates I've had. This is how good the quality of the cup of tea in bed was. That's my worth. And maybe this morning, that's a great label. Perhaps some of you this morning actually have a label that was put on there by a mother a long time ago, by something that they said or something they just never said. It's interesting, isn't it? We all carry labels, and they all give us a sense of worth. Perhaps if you're younger this morning, the CUI, your labels might come from social media, how many likes you've got, how many followers you've got. Or maybe it's just the old-fashioned success, how good your grades are, or maybe how much you can earn in work, or whether you get that next promotion. Constantly in life, we put labels of worth on ourselves, or we allow others to put labels of worth on us. And when it comes to those labels, I think they all come down to do this, be that, post this, perform like that. And these labels can be, they can be crushing, can't they? Sometimes they can be great, and they give us moments of, wow, I'm worth something. But in the very next moment, they can be taken away. Well, this morning, I want to ask the question, what are you worth when it comes to God? And what is the label that you get if you're a Christian? And do you know what is a label that is amazing? And it's a worth that will blow your mind that actually is worth even more than $45 million. And it's a worth and a label that isn't kind of linked to what you do to what you be, to what you post, or what you perform. And we're going to look at it in uh, the reading that we had. We're actually going to go through the reading backwards. We're going to look at the arrest of Jesus and then go back to the Garden of Gethsemane. But come with me, where um, as a church, if you're here for the first time, we're going through the Gospel of Matthew. We have been for about the last year or so. And we're coming to the end of Matthew's Gospel, timing it for Easter weekend, and over the next couple of weeks, slowing down in the last 24 hours of Jesus' life. And we're coming to the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, one Bible teacher, Sinclair Ferguson, says this, the Garden of Gethsemane is one of the most sacred and solemn scenes in the entire Bible. But before we get into that, we're going to look at the arrest and we're going to pray. A prayer that the Apostle Paul prayed in Ephesians. It's a prayer that is a wonderful one. And this is what the prayer says. Let me pray for you these words of Paul from Ephesians. I pray that we would have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, let's have a look firstly at the arrest, what happened, and then we look at the garden, why it happened. So here's the first point, the arrest. Um, if you're taking notes um, and you want to fill in the blank, my first point is this, the one who had it all gave it all. 
The one who had it all gave it all. As we saw um, over the last couple of weeks, um, it's Passover in Jerusalem. The place is jam-packed with people. There's people all over the place. It's a really kind of intense time. And so what we see in the passage is after this Passover meal, Jesus takes his disciples and takes them to a private garden, to a place to get away from it all. But it's a place that's meant to be kind of quiet and serene and calm, a place of prayer, but it quickly spirals out of control. You see him praying there. It's so calm that the disciples actually fall asleep repeatedly. That's how quiet it is. And then in verse 47, it says this, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Jesus' own people, the Jewish people, came to arrest him, to kill him in any way they could. It's interesting that it's the religious authorities who, according to John's gospel, had been searching the scriptures, hoping in them to find life. But even though all the Bible was about Jesus, they'd completely missed it and decided that really what they needed to do was arrest him and get rid of him. And it's even worse when you realize who they're being led by. Verse 47, it's Judas. If you remember last week, he was in the Last Supper. He was in the inner ring of the Twelve. Jesus had loved him. Jesus had even offered him bread, had even offered him forgiveness. And he was betrayed by one of his closest friends. One of the worst types of betrayal, if you've been betrayed in life, maybe in the family or in the workplace, um, it's one thing to be betrayed by people you don't know. It's something else to be betrayed by someone you love, someone you trusted. And here's Judas betraying him. Um, in Luke's gospel, it fills in the account a bit. It says this, while he was still speaking, a crowd came up and the man who was called Judas, one of the 12, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the son of man with a kiss? Even now we talk about being betrayed with a kiss. It's the worst of the worst. Now we need to remember, Jesus has been praying. This arrest has come. And then he's about to be arrested and then taken off and tried and taken through a sham court and killed. But it's important to pause and remember who this is. This is Jesus. He is God. Have a look down to verse 53 and look at what he says he could do. Verse 53 says this, Do not think that I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. You know, what's happening to Jesus doesn't have to happen. It's not a fate to complete. He's not someone who is just being moved along by all of these terrible people. No, no. This is Jesus who's decided to come, who's decided to be betrayed, who is allowing this to happen. In fact, if you look, there's um, two comments, verse 54. It says this, verse 54, but how then would the scriptures be fulfilled? That is to say what happened this way if he didn't do it. And then down at verse 56 as well, it says this, but this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. You see, this is no shock. This is nothing out of the blue. This has been planned. It's all the way through the Old Testament, these prophecies of the one who will come and he will really crush Satan, but in crushing him, his heel will be bitten. That is, there's one going to come who's going to take the punishment in our place. But this isn't just going back to the Old Testament. Jesus isn't just aware of the prophecies in the Old Testament. Ephesians 1 and other places tell us that this goes back into eternity. That God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in eternity planned this. Even before creating the world, I don't know if you've ever realized this, God knew that we were going to rebel. God knew that we were going to go our own way. And he knew that the only way he would be able to save us would be by giving himself for us, the ultimate sacrifice. You see, sometimes you do things for people, don't you? And uh, they, they, they don't appreciate it. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. If you were preparing something for someone and you knew they weren't going to appreciate it, what would you do? You'd probably go, I won't bother then. <laughs> I won't bother then. And if you knew they were going to do it, they weren't going to appreciate it, and then they were going to chuck it back at you and use it against you, you definitely wouldn't do it. But what happens if you knew they were going to do it, they were going to reject you, they were going to publicly humiliate you, and then you were going to have to pay for all the mess. And you were the one that was going to have to go to them and say, let's sort this out. 
and you were going to have to take all of that humiliation and shame on yourself, I think we just wouldn't go through with it. What's the point? But God, he creates us knowing everything we're going to do, everything he's going to have to do for us. And so Jesus here goes willingly. Um, a friend of mine used to tell a story, and I'm sure this happens to you. You see it a lot now with um, Facebook Marketplace and Gumtree and all of these uh, different things. You know, everybody's got something in the house now, and, you know, you, you can sell it. And, and sometimes when you're selling things from the house, you're like, I don't know what price to put on this. I have no idea. Sometimes there's things that you think that are worth a lot, and you put it on for like five pound, and even then no one's willing to buy it. And you're like, but I spent 50 pound on that. Why does no one want to give five pound? And then every once in a while, if you've ever put anything on eBay or something like that, you put it on for like seven pound, and next thing you're watching, and it's suddenly bumped up to 20 pound, 40 pound, 60 pound. Then people are private messaging you, like saying, well, I'll give you 100 pound. And you're thinking, what is going on here? And what you're learning is, with all of these things, is whatever you've got, there's no set price anymore. It's worth whatever anybody's willing to pay for it. That's what it's worth. So when it comes to our label, how do you know the price of your label, what you're worth? I would say it's this. It's whatever anybody's willing to pay for you. What was God willing to pay for you? Jesus, his only begotten son. Jesus is willingly going to the cross. This is the ultimate worth. It's got nothing to do with what they're doing, nothing to do with what they could potentially do. Jesus is willing to give his all for you. It's the big picture of the Bible. He knew this was going to happen. He's in divine control, but he still goes through with it. But you know, there's something I want us to see in the passage today. Even though Jesus wants to give us this label, and even though he wants to show us our worth and save us, do you notice what is Peter, we know from the other Gospels, what Peter does? He comes, he gets arrested, he's knowingly handing himself over, and then in verse 51 it says that, with that, one of his companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. You know, if you've got the little sermon sheet this morning, um, it says we want to give, we want Jesus to give it all. But actually I've done a little fill in the blank there. Because I think often we don't. Often we don't want Jesus to give it all. That's Peter. The big battle with Peter is he doesn't want Jesus to die for him. Remember in the transfiguration? Jesus has just started teaching Peter that he must die, you know, be handed over, crucified. And Peter says, no way, never. Jesus says, no, you don't have in mind the things of God. Peter, it's not about you paying the price. It's about me paying the price. That's why you get to transfiguration. And the father comes from heaven and says, this is my son, whom I love. With him, I'm well pleased. And I'm going to add something this time, Peter. Listen to him. I mean, if you're ever going to learn something, the transfiguration is probably the best way to learn it, is it not? Imagine if God takes you up the little skirid, appears there with all the greats, bright shining light, you're knocked to the ground in confusion because it's so amazing, and he tells you something. I think we would all go, I'll take note of that, Jesus. I'll definitely do that. But Peter still doesn't get it. Jesus finally comes to be arrested, finally about to be handed over. He knows what's going to happen, but what does Peter do? Sword out. No way, Jesus, don't worry. Don't worry, that cross ain't coming for you, Jesus. I am here, and look at me. I can knock off ears. Wow. <laughs> Peter's still trying to fill in his own worth. Peter's still trying to put his own labels on. The problem is, it's nothing. He can't save himself. I wonder, maybe you're here this morning and you know Jesus is great. You understand the gospel. You're looking at the Christian faith. But in the end, you're still hoping that you can fill in the worth. That you can label yourself. Deep down, you're hoping that you can be or do or perform or post something that will give you worth. You're still not letting Jesus to give you your worth. You won't let him do it. 
I think that's the hardest thing in life. It's so easy to become a Christian on one level because all you have to do is receive grace. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Even a child can do it. Anybody can become a Christian. You just need to realize that Jesus has lived the perfect life you couldn't live, that Jesus has died on the cross for you and risen victorious, and that everything is him. On the one hand, it's so easy to receive that, but in order to receive that gift, what do you have to do? You have to empty your hands of everything you're putting your hope in. All of your goodness and your good works and your good intentions and your hopes and your fears and your aspirations. You have to put them down and say, Jesus, they're nothing. You are everything. I wonder, do you need to come today and put down your sword, put down your own labels, and realize that Jesus has given it all for you? So Jesus here is, he's being arrested, but he's knowingly doing it, and he's doing it because he loves you, and he wants to give you this true eternal life. But I want to go deeper and look at what he does here and how it works. So let's go back, let's look at the garden, come back with me, and let's look secondly and finally at the garden. And if you're taking note, it's this, Jesus wants to swap cups. Jesus wants to swap cups. We're looking now at verses 36 to 46. The Garden of Gethsemane is is an amazing place. And in it, Jesus comes and prays. He asks the disciples to pray with him, but they fall asleep. There's nothing they can do. And he comes and he prays, and he prays three times, where he comes to the Father, and he's very honest. Have a look there at verse 38. He says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he's saying to them. Because Jesus knows that going to the cross is no easy thing. It's so important to understand this. Jesus dying on the cross wasn't something he just did because it was Friday and the end of the week and he could do it. I'll just give my life for them. I'm God, it doesn't really matter. Perhaps we think of kind of Jesus as coming to earth as kind of God, kind of in human flesh, but not really human. And so he kind of just swoons through life, finds it nice and easy. Every once in a while, there's a miracle, kind of gives away that he's God, and then dies on the cross, on the cross. but it doesn't really matter because it's only a couple of hours and he's God. But we forget, actually, that there's something far deeper about Jesus. He is fully God, but he is fully human as well. He really is one of us. He becomes one of us. And the cross is actually horrendous. He uses language here of the cup. This is what he says. Look down, verse 39. Going a little farther, verse 39. He fell with his face to the ground, and he prayed, My father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. You know, of all of these things that we could um, price, there's a cup. And Jesus comes to the Garden of Gethsemane and he uses this language, this, this symbolism of the cup. Jesus knows that there's a cup coming. Now, we know he's thinking about the cross. And when it comes to the cross, Jesus talks about it as drinking a cup. Let me walk through what it means by the cup. The first thing we know about the cup is it's something that makes him sorrowful to the point of death. Whatever this cup is, it is not a nice cup of coffee. It's not something nice. This is something that makes true man, true God, sorrowful to the point of death. So take Isaiah 51, verse 17. It says this, Awake, awake, rise up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, you who have drained to his dregs the goblet that makes men stagger. The cup in the Old Testament is a cup of wrath. That is the Bible's word for God's constant and pure and just hatred of all the sin and all the injustice in the world. And really, when Jesus goes to the cross, what he's doing is is all of these labels that people put on other people, all these labels that come on us as people who have rebelled against God, hated God, ignored God, done our own thing, ruined our world, ruined others, all of these labels are put in the cup. And on the cross, really, what happens is Jesus drinks this cup. And this is crazy. Because when you think about Jesus, if you were going to label Jesus... What label would you give Jesus? It'd be fascinating to see what we thought today. Maybe some of you would put down, well, good, holy, generous, healer, brilliant, 
honest, never lets us down, grace-filled, merciful. We give all of these labels to Jesus. But what happens on the cross is, as he drinks the cup of wrath, all of these labels that are ours becomes his. So on the cross, the one who is sinless, the one who is perfect, the one who gives it all, actually becomes us. He takes on all of our labels, liar, thief, hater, failure. He takes all of those labels in our place. And so it's the cup of wrath, the wrath of God, and it comes from the Father. No wonder, no wonder he shuddered at the thought of the cross, but now wonder at how when the arrest came and he could have called down 72,000 angels, he didn't do it. When he could have just parted the crowd and walked off, he didn't. When he could have got flaming swords for all of the disciples to fight off the chief priests and the authorities, he didn't. He willingly went to the cross, even though he knew how horrendous it was going to be. In the Old Testament, one of these prophecies that Jesus is fulfilling, there's a beautiful passage in Isaiah that describes what he's doing on the cross. This is how the prophet Isaiah put it. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Here's the amazing thing. All the labels that others have put on you, all the labels that you have put on you, all the labels that actually are true and you hope no one ever knows, all the skeletons in your closet, all of your shame and guilt, on the cross, Jesus drank them. Jesus took them. Jesus paid it all. It's a wonderful cup of substitution. And, and you see, what happens is there's, there's two cups. You see, when you read through the Old Testament, many of you are going, but John, there's another cup in the Old Testament, isn't there? Yeah, there is another cup in the Old Testament from probably our favorite psalm. Remember Psalm 23, the Lord's my shepherd. How does Psalm 23 end? It ends talking about a cup that will overflow where God's goodness will follow me all the days of my life. You see, the cup that Jesus deserved was a cup of blessing. The cup that Jesus deserved is the cup with all the labels of his goodness, of his majesty, of his mercy, of his wonder, of his beauty. He deserved blessings from God the Father all his life, overflowing, never running out. But what he does on the cross is he not just give, he not just takes our cup, he gives us his cup. That's the swap, that's the divine exchange. You see, if you become a Christian, it's not just that Jesus takes away your labels, takes away your need to prove your worth, takes away the punishment and wrath of God. No, no, it's far more than that. He's, he's too good to leave the gospel there. Jesus gives you his cup, his cup of blessing with his labels. So think about what we sung earlier on. I am a child of God. See, that's the label you get if you trust in Jesus forgiven, adopted, loved, perfect. That's what he gives you. So here's my question this morning. It's one very simple question. Have you swapped cups? Are you willing to put down your labels and give them to Jesus, trust in him and have his labels and know him forever? It's a wonderful offer. And it's an offer that's open to us all today. Friends, I, I don't know what labels you've got this morning. But Jesus is coming today and saying, I want to take all of those labels away. I want to give you a new label. Forgiven. Loved. You might be struggling today because of Mother's Day. You might be celebrating today because of Mother's Day. It could be a difficult season in your life could be a great season in your life. 
the gospel is for all of us because there's one label we all have. And it's this, we all sin. We've all gone against God. And that's the main label he takes away. Changes all the other labels as well. But there's all one label we can all agree on. And Jesus offers to take that away. And so I'm going to have a time of quiet now where I'm going to ask you, if you want to swap cups, why not do it today? Come and say, Jesus, I can see that my labels are ones I don't want to have. I've lived against you. I know I can't make my worth enough. But Jesus, I know you have died in my place. You've lived in my place. And I want to trust in you. So let's have a moment's quiet and then I'll lead us in prayer. Dear God, we come before you this morning knowing that there are labels that we have put on ourselves that are crushing. We come to you this morning knowing that there are labels that others have put on our life that are so hurting. But Father, we thank you that this morning you don't ask us to come under our own labels, to create our own worth. We thank you that Jesus has lived in our place. He's lived a perfect life. We thank you that Jesus on that cross was willing to drink the cup, to take our labels, to take our sin and our shame and our pain and our hurts and our sorrows and our failings, to take away everything that stands against us. And more than that, to give us his labels so that we, like him, can be called sons of God. So that we, like him, can call heaven our home. So that we, like him, can know joy and peace and security and love. Father, we pray, help us to swap our cups to trust in you. Help us to see the labels that are yours and to know the worth that you give. That we would rejoice in you. In the precious name of Jesus. Amen.